will larger be better. And the speaker is Thaman Shan Mug Aratnam. Because of his name, Shan Mug Aratnam, he's normally referred to by his first name, which is Thaman. However, I feel it's incumbent that we do address people properly. It's a very great pleasure, sir, to have you. Uh, he was educated at the London School of Economics and at Cambridge and then at Harvard. He spent his early professional career at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. He then became the chief executive of MAS. In 2001, he moved into politics and he was appointed in 2003 the Minister of Education a job which he did for five years, and then last year he stepped down and became the Minister of uh, Finance. In addition to that, he holds a number of very important positions, Deputy Chairman of the National Research Foundation, uh, on the board of the GIC, uh, the Government of Singapore Investment Corporation, uh, continuing on the board of uh, MASS, and involved particularly with the uh, local Indian community in Singapore. Again, as a Minister of Finance, he's in a key position, and it's a very great pleasure to welcome you, uh, Thurman, and to hear you speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Griffiths. Um, I'm reminded of a conference that I attended um, a few years ago, international meeting, countries from all over the world, and um, there was a European gentleman uh, on my right who surprised me. I'd never met him, and he was making an intervention, and he said, uh, as Mr. Sean Mugaratnam said, and he pronounced my name flawlessly. So I leaned over, uh, and I realized the reason for that. Uh, he was the Czech finance minister, and his name was far more difficult than mine. <laughs> so this is an Anglo-Saxon bias, if I might say. <laughs> now, uh, two things are happening uh, in the world today um, as a result of this crisis. First, I think we all agree there's a mood of distrust, in fact, a mood of extreme distrust, that's emerging towards liberal economic systems and towards globalized markets generally. We see it in the developed world, even in the states, where commitment to free markets has been generally much stronger than Europe, even in the states where the problems arose, the problems that led to this crisis arose, but also in the developing world, where the problems were received and received in a in a sudden and uh, highly accentuated form. The developing countries have in the last six to eight months gone through a very rough patch of a sudden collapse in markets for their goods, sudden withdrawal of credit, a sudden stop in liquidity in several instances. So it's been a rough time and you can understand the distrust that's emerged towards globalization, towards open markets, towards liberalization as a domestic agenda in these economies. At the end of the G20 meeting, I was listening to Gordon Brown give his press conference and he pronounced with a certain air of triumph the end of the Washington consensus. What is less clear, and in fact is most unclear, is what the alternative is. There has been no coherent exposition of an alternative to what is called the Washington Consensus. That's the first thing that's happened, a mood of distrust. The second thing that's happening is a sudden new faith in policy activism. There's been this dramatic rebalancing because of this crisis between markets and the state. It's been accepted across the political spectrum. It's not just social democrats and or the democrats in the US. It's more or less across the spectrum of public opinion. 
because people fear the alternative. They fear the alternative of the government not stepping in, injecting substantial fiscal stimulus and rescuing large institutions, particularly large banks. They fear the cascading of uh, the collapse across more markets than just the financial industry. And they fear the social consequences of that. So this new faith in policy activism is again a new thing. It's, it's a second new thing coming out of this crisis. Governments are now lenders, investors, insurers, and borrowers of last resort for the financial system. And in many instances, they're owners of non-industrial corporations because of the way the crisis is playing out. In short, what we've seen is a massive socialization of risk in the financial system and in global markets generally. In the short term, this may not be a miscalculation. It may not be a miscalculation given uncertainty and given the downside risks associated with the alternative of doing nothing or doing too little on the part of the state. But I think we now have to start talking and thinking about the end game. Where does this lead us to? What new balance are we working towards? What new social contract between market and state? And as we do so, we would best pay obeyance to the facts. It's best that we study empirical regularities over long periods of time as well as short. Study what has happened rather than what beliefs were. Be driven by realities rather than ideologies and try to find pragmatic solutions that can best work even if imperfectly. I think that has to be the approach. The whole game of competing beliefs has, I think, run its course, and we are now in a world where the competing beliefs are a relatively sterile debate, and what is more important is to observe the facts, learn from the facts, work out pragmatic solutions, keep adapting and improving them as we go on. So what are the key facts of the last 25 years? The first key fact is that the global market economy, including global financial markets, are good for your health. They're the good for everyone's health, including the majority of emerging market economies. They have succeeded in a way that no past period of history has and no alternative system has in re reducing poverty on a massive scale, on leading to an increase in growth for societies as a whole, and on, al on allowing emerging countries to catch up with the leaders, with the rich countries, in a way that's never been seen before. And this has been so seen most dramatically in the continental scale emerging economies of China and India. So that's the first fact. The global market economy and global financial markets, in other words, adherence to property rights and adherence to an open economy, have proved their worth. Second fact is that Beliefs in market, fundamentalist beliefs, or no holds barred beliefs in market efficiency, have not been borne out in reality. It's not a bad assumption to make that people respond to incentives, they act in their own interests, or that market prices incorporate information about companies and economies. It's not a bad assumption to make. But imperfections in that assumption. Are now, have now to be recognized as not just deviations from the norm, but themselves the norm. Imperfections in market efficiency are the norm, and they sometimes lead to sustained cycles of mispricing in markets, mispricing of risk, of herd behavior, and consequently, speculative bubbles. We should regard that as the norm in the functioning, especially of the financial markets, and not a deviation. And that is how we got to where we are today. The crisis, therefore, is one of a failure of regulation, not a failure of capitalism, but a failure of regulation that was premised on beliefs that were not supported by the facts.
premised on the belief that, first of all, each institution, particularly each bank, would look after its own risks in the interests of its shareholders. And second, that if they all do so, if they all do so individually, we need not worry about the risks of the system as a whole. Both of these premises have not been supported by the facts. So what, where does this, this lead us to as a tentative conclusion? First, I think we can conclude that the invisible hand of markets requires the visible hand of the regulator for them to work well and produce the benefits that are intended. Capitalism provides benefits that are superior to any alternative system where government plays a supporting role, not an encumbering role, but a supporting role of setting rules and acting as a referee, and very importantly, of being the stabilizer across the cycle, of seeking to diffuse bubbles before it is too late. We've got to avoid polar solutions and avoid any idea that this is about Washington consensus versus some alternative. Find pragmatic solutions that can allow free markets to work within rules that all market participants accept and which can, can try to mitigate the build-up of excesses that will always be inherent in a free market system. But of the future of our prosperity depends equally on how governments coming out of the crisis disengage or exit from the crisis management rules that they have taken. In particular, the very large ownership and guarantees that they have been forced to make because of the crisis, and the very large public debts that they have been forced to incur because of the crisis. There is, for a start, a problem of sustainability. Not many governments' balance sheets can carry the burden for very long, the burden of both substantial fiscal stimulus plus the use of public capital to rescue corporations. So we need a very clear plan for the raising of new revenues, clear plan for the cutback in spending, and you can't wait until the day that you run out of money before you articulate that plan because the markets will start judging you quite early. Plus, we need forward-looking government, government that looks beyond the crisis and beyond the cycle at public goods and in particular at provisions for human capital development that really lead to growth and lead to the ability of societies developed and developing to make the most of globalization by investing in skills and giving their people the best chances of seizing opportunities. In other words, we need growth-oriented government. Let me uh, settle on a few uh, key areas, a few propositions. First, financial regulation, because that obviously is the key issue of today. The central task that we have, I think, is that of devising a new regulatory framework, part of which is just an adaptation of old regulatory frameworks, that can encourage financial innovation, innovation that enhances growth while preventing systemic risk, a regulatory framework that can allow and encourage financial innovation while preventing systemic risk. And I'll have to add that the bulk of the innovation that we've seen in the last six or seven years has not been innovation aimed at what David Smith mentioned earlier, uh, funding of entrepreneurial risk or allocation of credit to where the returns are highest in an economy, the bulk of innovation in the financial system has quite frankly been aimed at regulatory arbitrage or accounting arbitrage. So we have to be careful about what we call innovation. What are the innovations that we are seeking to support through a regulatory framework and in fact encourage and allow more room for? And what are the innovations that are really a form of shifting risk around the table and often obscuring risk. The failure to monitor and regulate innovation 
uh, in the shadow banking system is our key challenge. That was the biggest gap in the system. We know the problems in banking, including subprime loan problems, but the largest gap in the system and the most complex one that we now face and we now have to address is what do we do about the shadow banking system, the non-banks and the off-balance sheet vehicles, the SIVs, the CIVs, and so on, investment banks, CIVs, mutual funds, all of which played a very important role in maturity transformation. That's the key role of a banking system. You take in deposits, which are often short to medium term, and you lend long. That's the key role of a banking system. But what we've seen in the last seven or eight years is the very rapid growth of a shadow banking system that was also performing maturity transformation, but largely unregulated, largely unmonitored. And that is what got us to where we are today. The key assumption that failed was that by having assets which could be marketed at any point, by having marketed, marketable securities on the asset side of your balance sheet, you could afford to borrow short, typically in the capital markets, in order to lend long, because you could get rid of this long-term security any time you wanted in a liquid market. And the key lesson we've learned is that markets are not continuously liquid. They seize up when risks finally get repriced and when confidence is lost. And the seizing up of liquidity in one market leads to the seizing up of liquidity across markets. That is the imperfection, that is the norm of financial markets. And we should take it as a given, as facts derived from experience, which should now guide us for the future. There are a few ideas that are now being debated extensively and are becoming quite fashionable. One is the idea of macro prudential supervision, a very sensible idea we know. In other words, you can't just look at micro supervisory issues, monitoring and supervising individual banks. You've got to look at the whole system risk. It's almost a cliche, but it's vital. It's vital that we place more emphasis on macro supervision. But, and, and, and secondly, it's vital that we avoid in future the Greenspan style neglect of bubbles. In other words, benign neglect of bubbles in the hope that the markets will self correct. Those are the two things we've learned. It's difficult to identify bubbles when they are happening, but it is better to be imperfect in attempting to do so than to not do so at all. It is difficult, but it is not impossible. Almost all bubbles involve in some fashion the growth of credit, the excessive growth of credit, and you can roughly find out if there's excessive growth of credit. They involve a narrowing of spreads between high quality and low quality debt, which is what we saw in a dramatic fashion until two years ago. And these are simple warning signs, not perfect, not something that you can write out in a model, but any seasoned supervisor should be able to tell when a bubble is forming and have the courage to be willing to pull the punch bowl uh, away. Counter-cyclical capital is a new concept which is now being debated. We all know the weaknesses of the Basel uh, framework, which had some pro-cyclicality in its features, particularly with regard to capital requirements for trading activities. But I would like to um, uh, suggest that there, we should not get too carried away with the idea of counter-cyclical capital or put too much store by counter-cyclical capital. The fact is, in good times, the markets, first, you know, I can assure you memories of this crisis are going to fail. And in good times, the markets are going to require less capital than necessary for banks than the regulator would like. A regulator that wants to have higher capital in good times in order to provide a buffer for bad times is not going to have their way because the market will require less. And if the regulator insists on more, the banks will shift activities into unregulated entities 
or into new forms of risk that don't attract the same regulatory capital. That's just in the nature of financial innovation and market competition, competition between institutions. And conversely, in bad times, when theoretically you would expect a regulator to allow capital to go below the norm, the markets won't allow it because it's in human nature that we are highly risk averse in crisis. The markets will not allow capital to be below the norm in crisis. So it will be extremely difficult in practice to operate a system of countercyclical capital, quite apart from the fact that no one will support the regulator if he or she wishes to do so. David Smith mentioned earlier that he doubts very much a good regulator can match a smart Wall Street banker and his lawyer. And equally important, there's bound to be pressure from politicians who are also keen to have the boom continue and who will also be impressed, if not paid off, by the same smart Wall Street banker and lobbies. So the political economy of a cycle is such that a regulator will have limited support if they want to have a very intelligent and carefully designed discretionary system of counter cyclical capital. I do think, therefore, that we have to resort to something simpler and cruder across the state of a cycle. You need some bright lines in regulation, like we used to have many years ago. Simple bright lines, necessarily crude, which everyone knows define the outer boundaries of what is possible. You need higher capital across the cycle than used to be the case. You need greater provision for liquidity, real liquid assets, not just things that are called liquid because they're marketable securities, real liquid assets to provide a larger buffer for times when liquidity seizes up in the securitized markets. We may need a simple leverage ratio, like the Swiss have moved towards last year. The leverage ratio for those who are unfamiliar is the ratio of total assets to uh, total equity of an institution, very simply. All of this, more capital, more liquidity, some form of leverage ratio, all rather crude, rather blunt, will exact a cost. There will be an economic cost. If you can do less maturity transformation than before, in other words, borrowing short to lend long, if you have to do less of it because of liquidity regulation, there will be a cost. If you have to keep more capital than otherwise, there will be a cost. And there will be an economic cost. Ultimately, it's the cost of capital that affects long-term investment and growth. So this is not a, it's a non-trivial trade-off that we have to think very hard about. What is the right balance between taking advantage of good times and providing a shock absor absorber for bad times? What is the trade-off between stability on the one hand and innovation and growth on the other? We do need to place more of a premium on stability. That's my view, and I think that is a sense of regulators globally. You do need to place more of a premium on stability. But there is a trade-off, and we should find a sensible trade-off that does not impede the functioning of a financial market in its good sense of providing capital to fund entrepreneurial innovation and risk and allocating credit most efficiently. I know I'm running out of time. So how, how long have I taken so far, by the way? Quite a long time. <laughs> Very good. Well, I, I am a politician. Can I say, I yeah. could carry on listening to you all day. It's absolutely fascinating. Well, but no, what uh, we'll about leave, three more minutes? Yeah, so we'll leave time for uh, questions. How about that? Um, because I was going to touch on um, emerging countries, and I'll leave that aside. But I must say one point, though, which is the counterpart to my point that you can't put too much store by macroprudential supervision and countercyclical capital, all of which is necessary. But you can't put too much store by it for the practical reasons I mentioned. Let's not have the sh light shine away from microprudential supervision, which is still extremely important, and let's not take the light off from national systems of supervision, which are still at the core of the international system. These are not unworkable things. The fact is, if I look at relatively liberal financial systems, Australia, Canada, Singapore, Hong Kong, 
have avoided the problems of this financial crisis. It's not as if we have closed economies. We are highly open economies. But we did the old-fashioned things, hands-on supervision, including on-site inspection, not resting everything on mathematical models, which anyway most of us didn't understand, <laughs> going with a measure of judgment, principles-based supervision, old-fashioned things that we learned from others and carried on practicing. It is possible to regulate institutions diligently and well. There will still be crises and cycles, but let's not, take, let's not shine the light somewhere else at the macro and international coordination and the like at the expense of getting it right nationally. That's still the foundation for any robust international financial system. I was going to talk about inequality because I think it's a key challenge for governments going forward, and in particular the role of governments in providing a framework through education and training frameworks to encourage social mobility and allowing every skill, every worker to take advantage of the opportunities provided by global markets. But I've run out of time. <laughs> and I'll be happy to take questions on it if you want. Could we please have the lights on again? Can I say that was a marvellous lecture and there are so many questions I want to ask but uh, I mustn't abuse my position as chairman. Lady here. Thank you. My name is Tatiana and I come from Ukraine. Um, I would like to continue a little bit your um, discussion about the bubbles and that we have to avoid them in the future. And um, you have said that bubbles come from the excessive uh, growth of credit. Could you please comment on the uh, fact that countries inject in billions of dollars of uh, um, stimuluses, they actually increase their, their debt, their external debt, and countries uh, reaching for those money from the IMF, like Ukraine, <laughs> they also increase their external debt. Among, apart from the statement that the future generation will carry those costs, what are the present implications of this growing debt? Thank you. Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Unfortunately, one of the greatest challenges that governments face in a, once you're in a crisis is in the distinction between what is right for the short term and what is right for the long term. The reality of the matter is that we all want financial markets to come to life again. We want them to get, start working again. And that means banks have to be willing to extend credit to companies and individuals. And it also means, realistically, that the securitized markets have to also come to life again. Neither are happening. So what do governments do? They can either take a purist approach of waiting for the market to correct itself, which could take five or six years, with a self-realizing dimension to it, where each decline in economic activity leads to a worsening of accrual assets on the bank's balance sheets, leading to a worsening of their capital positions, and the, their ability to lend credit becomes even more impaired. So you can get a self-realizing cycle of decline in the nature of a crisis, in the nature of a severe market correction, which I think governments have to avoid. So governments have had no choice but to engage first in substantial demand stimulus to prevent what would be an even worse decline of credit quality on the, banks, on, on the books of the financial system, quite apart from preventing an excessive rise in unemployment. And governments have had no choice but to provide some form of direct support to impaired financial institutions. That is what you do in the short term. You know it's not right for the long term, and you've got to work a clear strategy for disentangling and exiting from that game. And that is a challenge faced in the U.S. especially because they've had to do it in a very substantial way. It's a challenge that's going to have to be faced in Europe as well. So we all know what's right in the long term, but we should be very careful about what we wish for in the short term. Gentlemen here. 
Roger Hartman in uh, Luxembourg. I would like you to elaborate on the education issue because I know that uh, via IBF and via the Wealth Management Institute, Singapore was able to develop uh, an amazing capability to go very tailor-made in an education process, trying to put Singapore at the lead of the financial industry all over Asia. Can you comment on that? Well, I'm not sure we are in the lead. Um, we are doing things which we think uh, are basic precepts that every country in a knowledge-based global economy would want to do if they want to come out amongst the winners and not amongst the losers. All of us will face a challenge of inequality, not just because of this crisis. It was a secular trend because of globalization. There was a doubling of the global workforce over a period of 15 years, and that has vastly increased the supply of unskilled and mid-skilled labor and also increased the demand for highly skilled workers, technicians, engineers, professionals of all forms. There's been a technological shift over the last 25 years that has done exactly the same. Increased demand for those with high skills, lesser demand for those with low skills. So that's a challenge we all face. What do we do about it? One strategy is redistribution. And that is unfortunately still a predominant strategy for many governments in the world, particularly in the developed economies. Redistribution through the tax system, redistribution through social expenditures. We all have to do some of it, let's be frank. But I think we have to avoid too pessimistic a view of what government is capable of. Too pessimistic a view of government's ability to provide a framework that incentivizes growth, that provides opportunities, and provides individuals up and down the social ladder with chances to pick up skills to make the most of those opportunities. Education is the most important strategy we have in Singapore, economic, social, national. And it is because, first because we have nothing else apart from a small group of people on a small island, but more importantly, even if you're a larger country, quite frankly, we think that's the way in which you retain an optimistic view of the future. It is possible, it is not impossible, to provide schooling, technical institutions, vocational institutions, polytechnics and universities that allow every individual to develop the skills to do well in the job, to do well in the workplace, and to upgrade his or her family and get a better life. It is possible. It's happening in, the, it's happening in Asia. It's happening in China in a huge way. It's happening in India. It's happening in Southeast Asia. It's even happening in Singapore, despite the fact that we are a relatively developed economy, this has already gone through several cycles of social mobility. And for natural reasons, it gets more difficult over time because all the bright poor kids from two generations ago are now no longer poor heads of households. But we still see in every new generation now in our primary schools, if you provide a high-quality public education system with the best headmasters and principals rotated around the system, with teacher quality, uniformly high across schools, you get mobility. You get everyone who's bright, not just academically, but with a knack for doing something special. You get given the chance of getting ahead in life. I, just to finish up on that point, you know, I, I spent five years as education minister, and it's something I'm <laughs> a little passionate about. I think it's very unfortunate what we've seen in the last 20 years particularly in the developed eco economies. Some of them, including Britain, used to have a rich tradition of polytechnic education and vocational education. And in a, with the idea that it is somehow more egalitarian, they've converted all these institutions into quote-unquote universities and think that their job as governments is to push as many people as possible up through universities which of course is only possible if you create more and more causes that people can pass. And I, you know, I, I, I better not mention which causes I have in mind, but, but that's what's happening. And we've lost the engineering tradition, we've lost the technical tradition. Now that is to my mind an elitist strategy. It's not an egalitarian strategy. You have to judge a strategy by its outcomes. Does it provide people when they exit the education system 
with real skills they can use to earn an income and keep upgrading through life? Or does it just provide you the political satisfaction of knowing that your input strategy worked and you got a whole load of people through into university, at least the front door? I think outcomes matter. I think recognizing differences of ability and skill is an egalitarian strategy, not an elitist strategy. And we intend to pursue, keep pursuing that in Singapore. Have many peaks of excellence, not just the academic peak, many ways of recognizing the diversity of skills that a knowledge-based economy really needs. It's not just the people at the top. It's everyone. I had even thought of a third question, but that was just a spontaneous applause, and I think that says everything. It's been a great honor to have you with us.